This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. Watchers over Manhattan. That's straight ahead on a view from the bunker. Prepare for spiritual war by arming yourself with information. Take advantage of these specials through March that dig deep into the Bible to help you make sense of the chaos around us. First, our Veneration Bundle, our two co-authored books, plus the travelogue DVDs from our Israel tours. An $85 value, just $45 plus shipping and handling. The Second Coming of Saturn Bundle, featuring my book and the 13-part companion DVD, a $50 value for just $35 plus shipping and handling. The This Is War special offer, featuring the Second Coming of Saturn, four DVDs, and seven hours of audio interviews with Bible scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, a $145 value for just $75 plus shipping and handling and the Gilbert Fiction Collection. All eight novels in Sharon's Red Wing Saga series, plus my two novels, a $200 value for just $140 plus shipping and handling. These offers are available through March only at our online store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And again, we thank you for your prayers and support. Watchers overlooking the Flatiron District of New York City, the Manhattan borough to be precise, why are they there? or at least one specifically. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. We're going to talk about that tonight, a uh, new piece of artwork that is supposed to represent women's empowerment or something, but uh, it actually looks like it represents something a whole lot different, something supernatural, actually. And joining us to talk about this is uh, kind of our go-to guy when it comes to semiotics, looking at symbolism embedded in the art and architecture of uh, the world around us, and also the world of entertainment and music. Uh, He is uh, the author of the book, Our Gods Wear Spandex, The Secret History of Comic Book Heroes. He blogs at secretsun.blogspot.com and is the proprietor of a place where you can dig deeper into subjects like this, the Secret Sun Institute of Advanced Synchromysticism. And we'll talk, have him talk about that before the end of the program. We welcome back to the bunker, Christopher Knowles. So, Chris, this uh, eight-foot statue of a woman with um, ram's horns shows up on a New York City courthouse, um, and uh, this is supposed to represent uh, women's empowerment. It's a tribute to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg or something. It's got the got her lace on there and everything, so I guess that's that's true. Uh, <laughs> we didn't buy it. I'm, I saw you, you didn't buy it either. That's why I had to have you back on. What was your reaction when you saw that uh, that thing? Uh, it's just, you know, I don't know if it's desperation or impunity, but this stuff is just getting more and more in your face all the time. And and that's a perfect example of it because there are so many, you know, when you break that down and you look at that character, uh, you know, I have Knowles's, you know, Knowles's laws. And the first law, I, I think all three laws apply here. The, the first one is when this, Whenever there's a controversy about symbolism in the media, it's usually disguising a different symbolic message altogether. So we see that where it's like, oh, it's Ruth, B- you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's the cover. You know, that's the cover story, right? That's so you can't criticize it. That's like in- that's how they insulate it, right? But my second, you know, the second law, the second Knowles law, is that the old cults of state will be reinstated under the cover of woke. So so in other words, wokeness is being used to reintroduce, you know, these old gods from the ancient world. So we see elements of Inanna and Kadesh and, um, you know, all these in that family, Ishtar, Astarte, all these, all these figures, right? And, but there's also that weird, like it's chimeric. And we see a lot of these chimeric forms, right? And, but it's also, I think most people look at it and go, that's demonic, you know? I mean, even without the the hair done, sort of the ram's horns and the hair almost reminds me a lot of Tanit, right? So mm-hmm, Tanit, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, consort of Baal, who, who, you know, the Carthaginians made sacrifices to. Right. You know, with the Tophets, right? They would sacrifice their children. Um, so there are all these elements embedded into that. But just consider what this is. So this is a appellate courthouse, right? This is part of the Supreme Court system in New York, right? State of New York. Um, 
this is as official as it gets. You know what I mean? So when a symbol like this is seen on a building like that, it's making a deliberate statement. It's making a very, to me, a very dark statement, you know, because I, I do see that figure as demonic, you know what I mean? I, but the neighborhood itself, Madison Square, is something that I've been looking at for like 13 years now, because back in 2010, there was this art exhibit, quote unquote art exhibit, that there are always art exhibits, right? Mm -hmm. um, called Event Horizon. And basically what it was is all these like naked male statues, you know, featureless um, that look like they had like wings broken off. Right. Hmm. So they look like angels with their wings torn off. Right. And they were placed on the tops of buildings all around Madison Square. They were on sidewalks. I mean, there were several of these figures. And, you know, even back then, I was like, that's the watchers. This this is watcher adoration. And it's something that I didn't really have a. a a strong sense of back then. Like I, I didn't really understand the phenomenon of watcher worship that really only in the past few years I've really come to see as a thing, right? But when you look at this, you can go again, go go back online, go to Google, or whatever, and just look at this. And it's very clearly like watchers, because they're they're watching over the street. You know, they're standing at the, at the um, ledges of buildings and so on. And there was also, so that was 2010. And then in that same neighborhood, uh, Madison Square, um, there was this display, again, another art exhibit, right, uh, called Whiteout. And it was basically these like white orbs that they had hovering over the entire park, <laughs> right? And it was it was incredibly sinister. And, you know, the interesting thing about this, too, is that this is a block away from the Grand Lodge in New York, the Grand Lodge, you know, the Masonic Lodge. And it's a vent horizon display um, when it was displayed in London was also right in the vicinity of a Grand Lodge. So there's also I mean, there's obviously some sort of connection there between this exhibit or this ritual adoration i think is more accurate and uh freemasonry i don't know what it is exactly but um there you go so there's so there's a background that i've been and i i know that neighborhood really well because i used to work for toy biz right and toy biz had their showroom like right across the street from from madison square so i mean and i used to work in the empire state building for a number of years i used to walk you know when i used to walk downtown i would walk through that neighborhood so it's a very, I don't know, it's a very potent neighborhood in some ways, like symbolically, ritualistically. So when they put a statue like that, that I think, you know, even the normiest normie would look at that and say, there's just something amiss there. There's something off, you know, this golden idol um, placed on top of, you know, this building when you have all these historical lawgivers you know that's sort of the theme mm -hmm. of the other statuary there but moses they're all, and zoroaster you know, and so on yeah exactly confucius like moses yeah. yeah exactly and they're all in you know uh marble or, or alabaster and then there's this golden figure it, you know it draws attention to itself but um it's it's in the context and i i, I posted on this today on on my blog that we're seeing these demonic, like explicitly demonic statues being installed in London, Rome, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Athens. I mean, this has been going on for about five or six years now. And it's to me, it's obviously making a statement. Um, like, for instance, uh, back in 2018, just before the Met Gala, you know, talking about Anana, right? The gala, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. <laughs> um, they put this hideous demonic statue on the roof of the Metropolitan Mu Museum of Art. Um, and it's just the most repulsive thing you've ever seen. It's this like alien with, you know, quote unquote alien, but it's clearly a demon. And it has like the, the triple, you know, of Hecate, the three faces. Right, right. right. And um, and then it has somebody, another figure, another giant figure bowing to it, like in, in like a robe. So it's like clearly a supplicant. So it's 
it's demonic worship. Like, there's no reasonable person could look at that image. It's called We Come in Peace, the name, the name of the artist is Huma Ababa. Um, nobody could look at that, uh, that imagery and think this is not explicit demonic worship. And it's, it's in your face. It's all over the world now. And, um, you know, it seems to be like temporary, uh, these temporary installations, but they're always very well publicized. And, you know, and like I said, so in this case, we're seeing, you know, not only this, the symbolic messages being mixed up, but we're also seeing wokeness being used as cover, right? For, for what is, you know, to most people looks clearly demonic. And, um, you know, it's kind of replacing like one of these older statues. So it, it literally is like Knowles's all, you know, Knowles's laws so far all in one. And it's disorienting. So the art is being used to sell a certain message that those who are in charge of these types of insula- installations are sort of signaling what they're trying to uh, invoke or impose, well, or both. <laughs> it's like planting your flag. You know, um, you know, when you conquer territory, you plant your flag there, right? And that that's how I see these things. Now, some of these uh, some of these installations are, are moving. Uh, you know, because this this is a temporary installation. This uh, statue, which is called Now, Sharon pointed out to say, "Oh yeah, Nat- National Organization of Women, uh, Equal Rights Amendment." Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I said, okay, yeah, I, I get that. Um, but it's uh, I guess this summer they're going to move it to Houston, just as they moved the Triumphal Arch um, from Palmyra, which was the arch that led to the Temple of Baal or Baal for mm-hmm. scholars out there. Uh, they set up replicas of that in in New York, in London. Uh, and elsewhere, Washington, Washington D.C. They they kind of moved it around, um, but well, you, th- you know, it's funny you should mention that because this this image, this demonic, this very explicitly demonic image that was on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum is now on the Washington Mall. Okay, where they also had the um, the the, Pal- the Palmyra Arch, right? So. Yeah, I mean, I've been watching this stuff for a while, and it's just very clear. The the thing that really flipped me out too—I don't know if you saw this—but um, outside of San Francisco City Hall, there's um, allegedly it's supposed to be Ashurbanipal, you know, the mm-hmm. Assyrian king, right? Like, wh- wh- first of all, why is he there? But it's done up precisely in the same imagery that they would depict Gilgamesh. Okay. In the in in, Bab- in the ancient Babylonian Mesopotamian world, right? But that infers Nimrod, right? So there's always right. been the association with Gilgamesh and, and Nimrod. So I mean, this is what I'm saying. And and there's also the um, the Babylon Gate in the lobby, uh, not the lobby, the courtyard of um, Hollywood and Highland, which is where the Oscars are held every year. Right. Right. Sure. So. If you go back there, you see it's like I think it's Nisroch and Asher on this giant gate that is allegedly based on the gate in Intolerance, the D.W. Griffith film. So um, there's always a color yeah, film. yeah, which which we actually watched. It's available to uh, stream now on the uh, mm. uh, and and the only thing I'd known about D.W. Griffith was uh, he made that uh, Ku Klux Klan movie. Was it uh, Birth of a Nation? Um, mm-hmm. But found out that this movie Intolerance was uh, considered a is considered a, a masterpiece by film critics. And uh, when you look at what he did at that early date, I mean, my gosh, that's like a, th- what, a 30 story replica of the gates of Babylon that he built more than a hundred years ago in, in, uh, in Hollywood. Yeah. It's like, huh? Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was before the unions took over Los Angeles, right? <laughs> they took over the film industry, <laughs> but what does it do in there now? Like, what does it have to do with anything? Right. Now? Why'd they leave it? I, and the interesting thing is that so the um, the building that became the Kodak Theater, I don't, I think they call it something else now, but that was originally the Grand Lodge of California, right? And then it moved across the street, and that's where Jimmy Kimmel does his show. Hmm. Like Jimmy Kimmel literally does his television program in the Grand Lodge of California, um, <laughs> which is right across the street. So it's, see, you see what I'm saying? So it's yeah, just like. Yeah. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. 
Yeah, are you, are you sensing a pattern here? Now, <laughs> like there's a little bit of a through line going on here, I think. You know? now, Ma- Madison Square, am, am I right in assuming that that's where Madison Square Garden is located? No. Um, okay. Well, that's an interesting story. So it, it was back in the day, um, but they moved it to 33rd Street, of course. Right? <laughs> it goes from 23rd to 33rd, right? It gets a, it's, it's a promotion. It, it's, you know, it, it's... Yeah, it's mo- it moved up a few, uh, few degrees, yeah. But they what they tore down the original Penn Station, which New Yorkers are still furious about because it was a beautiful building. There were two buildings that were like basically twins, and one was the original Penn Station, and the other one was the um, the New York Post Office. And I think, as far as I know, they've converted the post office back into Penn Station because. Penn Station and Madison Square Garden, as they were built, it looks like a toilet bowl. And it's just, it's just the worst architecture. You know, it's that brutalist crap that was popular in the fifties and sixties, ugly as sin. But it was where Madison Square Garden was back in the day, and then they moved it to, like I said, to Thirty Third Street. Okay, so Madison Square Park there at Madison and Twenty Third. I'm looking at a an overhead map. I'm just curious about that because one of the things that kind of surprised me as I was researching the, um, the cult of the Nephilim, the, the, the Rephaim mm-hmm. in, in the Old Testament period was the way the concept of the garden developed. The garden is, um, the, the word in, in Hebrew is gan, which is a cognate for a word in Akkadian that is in turn a cognate for a word in uh, a, a, an early Persian dialect. Uh, and that word is paradisa, where we get the word paradise. Well, wouldn't um, Akkadian predate Persian? Uh, yeah, this, like I said, this is like an Avastan or some some early, early dialect. I mean, well before mm. there were such a thing as Persians. I mean, the Elamites occupied that uh, territory back in the day. Mm. But, uh, but the word, as it was translated later into uh, what became uh, Persian... The uh, the earliest form of it, I'd have to look up the research on it because it's you know, etymology is not my strength. That's really Sharon's bailiwick. But uh, paradisa, which of course is where we get the Greek word from, which we get paradise. But the idea was a ramparted garden, like an enclosure that was reserved for the king. Mm. Hence the Garden of Eden. But it was transformed in the uh, you know, by the Amorites who took over Mesopotamia around 2000 BC or thereabouts from 2000 BC to 1500 BC, they kind of docu- do- dominated the lands of the Bible and the garden was where the King was buried and you offered sacrifices to him twice a month so that his spirit could join the council of the Rephaim or something in the afterlife, mm-hmm. um, which is why it was such a big thing in the old Testament. If you notice the Kings of Judah were all buried in the tombs of their fathers until you get to the son of Hezekiah, Manasseh, who was known for sacrificing his children to Molech, who was just mm. an, another name for Baal Haman, the Phoenician husband of Tanit. That's Tanit. right, that's right. And he was buried in the king's garden, as was his son Amon, who also sacrificed children to Molech. So um, the, the whole idea of the, this area of the Madison Square and the Madison Square Garden, or the Madison Square Park now, um, having such a concentration of these statues, mm summoning mm-hmm. or evoking these these uh old gods the the watchers is is really interesting well also too is that it's 23rd street and this is 2023 so it just seems to me that you know i i understand how ocd these people tend to get with hmm. the symbolism you know and everything has to kind of line up so i i don't think that's i don't think that's cool we either. we we actually rented a house once in uh a small town in Indiana where the street number, I, I history nerds. So I was like doing research, genealogy research, history of the town, just to learn more about the town. And the street number of the house we bought or rented rather was originally 310. Now the guy that we rented it from was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, member of the Shriners. He, after he bought it, had it changed to 312. So it was 312 or 33. Seriously. It's OCD, man. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just, it's neurotic, you know. It's it's neurosis elevated to religion. We we've really. seen we've seen this in in other ways too, though. When we were in Colombia back in 2006, there were a group of Buddhist monks who came through Colombia, and of course that's uh, College Town, University of Missouri's there, 
and they did they they did a a uh, mandala sand mandala which is that beautiful artwork that they do and of course when they're all done with it uh, then they just essentially they destroy it they sweep it all up and sweep the sand into a local body of water well they swept it into uh, a branch of the river that fed into the missouri and everybody in town was like oh this is so beautiful this is wonderful i had just interviewed peter lavenda and had read some of the stuff that he'd written about the apocalyptic beliefs the apocalyptic eschatology of some of the tantric buddhists and how it's a lot more violent than than most of us would assume of buddhists and that when they do this with these mandalas, it's actually a summoning of their gods. And then by sweeping the sand into the waterway, they're essentially basically saying, okay, now this body of water belongs to you. So mm. th- this appears to be almost a uh, an ongoing magical working of some sort. Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, it's so complex and it's so far reaching. And I'm not even sure... You know, I don't necessarily believe that it's all just like one big group that's orchestrating it all. I, I think there are a lot of different sects and cults um, sort of all putting their own spin on it. And that's why we see, you know, like I said, all these big demon statues. It almost seems like this is like a competition among some of these groups to, you know, create the most grotesque looking <laughs> demons, you know, to basically cast spells on people. Uh, but, you know, so much public art for the, since the post-war period has basically been psychological warfare. And I also think that spellcraft is also a form of psychological warfare. And, and it gets to the point in many ways when you start to look at how esoteric a lot of these um, intelligence groups can get, particularly like these sort of black groups within the, these groups, uh, you know, these agencies. Um, it gets very hard to, to sort of parse out what is PSYOP and what's spellcraft. But to me, like, I just start to see all of it in, in the aggregate, like, as is gestalt as, as spell work. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, it, it wasn't until I really studied, like, I learned about how this stuff really works and has worked throughout history because there's all this kind of like Harry Potter stuff and, you, you know, you wave a wand around and like, you know, this happens and this pops out of nowhere. And you know, it's like, that's just, that's just fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that was the real, I'll tell you what was the real turning point for me. And, I, you know, people who follow me are probably sick of this story already. But I was reading um, an interview or a story in Rolling Stone about um, Augustus Bear Owsley, who is the, the Grateful Dead's acid cook right and but he was he got involved in the dead when they were called the warlocks of, of all things <laughs> um right and uh, but it was because the warlocks were the house band for ken kesey's acid tests and ken kesey's acid tests were just basically um field testing of mk ultra techniques straight up and down and i there was so there's a story that that owsley told where you know he was watching all this go down and he just, he couldn't take it. He went out to the car and was just, you know, was kind of like freaking out and trying to catch his breath. And Ken Kesey came out and said, you know, what's, what's the matter? You know, what's wrong? And, and Stanley said, or Owsley Stanley, whatever his name was, <laughs> he said to him, you know, what you're doing is witchcraft. It's, it's been known forever. You know, the, the forces that you're playing with, you know, the, the, the angels and in, in the demons realm, the angelic and the demonic realm has been known forever and like these techniques are not new. And this is when I really started to put together that MK Ultra is really was really itself a black magic work and that it wasn't per se about you know mind control. I mean that was part and parcel of the entire package. But I, I honestly believe because I think this is still going on and I think it's it's going on more widespread than ever, right? Um, what I call MKL to 3.0 with all the, uh, you know, feeding kids, you know, all these prescription drugs and mm-hmm. now the, all the hormones and all the trans stuff. Um, they're basically preparing people to become vessels for entity possession. Mm. And I've been, I've been saying this for a while. And, you know, this is something I kind of put together when I was, but the, the aha moment was, you know, that, that, um, that passage in that article when he's saying, 
you know, he's talking about the, the acid test and he's like, this is, this is black magic. This is witchcraft. You know, this, this isn't, this isn't entertainment and it certainly wasn't science. And then I went back and I read a lot of the papers of scientists reporting on like the things that, um, you and Cameron was, was doing. And mm -hmm. they're all like, this had absolutely no scientific value whatsoever. But all those techniques have been known for a very long time, you know, sensory deprivation, uh, ordeal, drugs, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the patterning with the tapes, you know, the, it's, it's basically mantras, right? I mean, they basically were playing like the same um, phrase or sentence or even word mm -hmm. on a tape loop thousands of times. That, that's a mantra. Mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm saying? So sure, it's like sure. all the techniques that were quote unquote scientific to achieve quote unquote mind control are actually uh, sorceress. It's all sorcery. Well, it's all demonic sorcery. In, in the interviews that uh, I did with uh, Peter Lavenda back in the day, uh, we talked to him several times about his uh, Sinister Forces trilogy. And it, it struck me that what he was describing in all of this uh, dissection of the work of guys like Cameron and Gottlieb and uh, you know, the MK Ultra type stuff was to try to create demonically possessed Manchurian candidates. Exactly. I mean, what we're seeing, it's, it's funny because, you know, I've been listening to you for forever. And it, I think I even said this to you before. It's like <laughs> Russ Dizdar's Black Awakening is, yeah. is now. I mean, it's, it's mainstream. That, and, and, you it's know, gone that, live. What was really bizarre to me was that before I'd ever he heard of Russ Dizdar, I started writing the novel The God Conspiracy, which we republished uh, about a year and a half ago when it became a lot more relevant than it had been when, I first, when we first released it back in 2006. But uh, I didn't hear of Russ and his work until I heard him on uh, Visigoth's program from the uh, the Grassy Knoll mm, geez, um, yeah. back in 2005 and, and thought, okay, this is pretty sensational, but he sounds intelligent. He sounds like he really is talking about you – know, and it didn't dawn on me until later that I had sort of described in my novel before I'd heard of Russ and the Black Awakening, I sort of described the Black Awakening. Um, not that I'm crediting myself with any intuition or insight. Sharon's a lot more spiritually sensitive – to things unseen than I am, um, but uh, uh, give yourself a little more credit. I I don't know. It it, it just seemed like an obvious thing. If you're going to create mass panic and chaos, uh, that that's a good way to do it. Just you know, random acts of violence all breaking loose at once. But if we take Leviathan or chaos as a uh, as an entity, which I have come to do over the intervening years, uh, it seems to make sense. And if we understand what Crowley that, called Karanzan, right? Alistair Crowley called that that spirit that you're referring to, the spirit of Leviathan, right? Um, who shows up in all sorts of uh, ancient pantheons from Mesopotamia to the Norse. Uh, it it still has some influence over what's going on in the world today, just like you know this Baal, Haman, Molech, Enlil, Saturn, Kronos, whatever you want to call them. Uh, just, you know, like a mob boss or a gangbanger who's uh, in, in prison, he's, he's still got minions who can influence things on the streets. And that's manifesting in these these things that are popping up around us. You mentioned that the trans movement is an element of this. And this is something that, that just makes me really thankful that our daughter is in her 30s now. You know, that she's mm -hmm. not going through school right now in a, in a public school setting. Because even here in the Ozarks, in the little towns around us, you know, the town just south of us, the county seat's got 440 people. Uh, the town where we bank and, and uh, you know, uh, do our grocery shopping's got 1,400. And even there, because of Title IX, the Department of Education mm. at the federal level uses Title IX to intimidate uh, schools in places where you wouldn't expect to see this, um, this agenda. Because folks here in the Ozarks are really, really conservative. Yeah, um, well, it, it's, it, it's you know, for lack of a better term, it's a form of spiritual warfare. And they seem to be really concentrating with, like, the drag shows and all the rest of it in these conservative areas. It's it's basically, um, you know, it's like insurrection. It's a, it's a kind of a form of insurrection. Yeah. Um, because, again, it's the, using the cover of woke. But... You know, you know about Inanna and Ishtar. I mean, all her priests were, you know, for lack of a better term, trans, weren't they? I mean, um, they were eunuchs and, and yeah, cross dressers, but you, but also eunuchs, and uh, and this you know extended into the worship of um, Sibylle, uh, you Kadesh. know, 
simulated right, right. Kadesh, um, Astarte. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's all just basically culturally focused incarnations of the same goddess, right? Right. Um, but you know, it's my from what from my readings. And it's kind of thing we kind of have to read between the lines. I think all the priests, priestesses, the priestess class, you know, certainly in Mesopotamia and probably in like Syria and, you know, the Levant and so on, were all trans. I, I, you know, when I think about the, the cultural environment and how women were just basically seen as property, right? Uh, I can't imagine that you would trust, you know, your state worship to, to your property. If you understand what I'm saying, and then the fact, you know, in the Bible throughout, you know, the the translation has, be, has been handed down to us as sodomite, right? Mm -hmm. But the the biblical the Hebrew term is kadesh, and kadesh were the, you know, the temple prostitute, right? Uh, right. Male temple prostitute uh, priestess priests of all these, you know, this, this family of goddesses and, mm -hmm. and, and of which, you know, the goddess Kadesh or Kadesh, as we see in, you know, show up in, in Egypt more formally, but had come to Egypt from Canaan, um, from Canaan. Exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's being revived. It's being revived. And yeah. this is what I'm saying. It's like the old state cults, you know, worked, for the elite class for thousands of years, right? Mm -hmm. And Christianity put a stop to a lot of these practices that favored this elite class, you know? And we're seeing like what I, what I would call a revanchist cr crusade on the part of, and I, I think these cults have morphed, you know, I don't think they're, they're exactly the same as they were 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. But I think in essence, it's the same phenomenon. You understand what I mean? Oh yeah. And when I talk about the watchers, um, recently on my Patreon, I did this, this whole presentation on the space brothers, space brother phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. Now the space brothers are just basically incarnations of the watchers. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they're also, you know, all these space brother cults are incredibly authoritarian. Hmm. Um, you know what I mean? Like almost totalitarian. And all these, all these space brothers cults always had the same message, like, uh, you know, diminishing Jesus or, you know, just basically Judaism or Christianity or, you know, just basically that, that whole family of religions. Right. So it's so that they're always diminished. It's like, oh, you don't understand what they're really saying. It's really all about this, right? But at the same time, it's like introducing, you know, the replacement is the, the Space Brothers, aka the Watchers, right? But it's all just incredibly cruel and authoritarian mindset that comes with it. And and I I trace this back to Bailey, uh, Alice Bailey. Mm -hmm who was very explicit in her watcher, watcher worship. I mean, she, she, I don't know if we discussed this, but Alice Bailey in her early book said the watchers were the good guys. So mm -hmm. the watchers basically sacrificed themselves. They were, they were the sacrificial ones who were following God's orders. So God wanted the, the watcher angels to come down and bring this, knowledge or consciousness or awareness to humanity and the watchers volunteered right they were the good guys they they were the sacrificial ones and now they're waiting they were imprisoned you know there was this whole misunderstanding this whole mix-up right mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like you know the host of heaven you know michael uriel gabriel so on and so forth uh defeat the watchers and condemn them to tartarus but you know, this is all, this is all going to be reversed. And you, and this is explicit in Bailey. This is not like interpretive. Like, I'm not telling you like how I see it, right? Like, oh, it's kind of like this. It's like, she, no, she says this just straight up. They were the good guys. They were acting on orders of God and they will be released. And 
you know, we'll have paradise on earth. And of course, paradise on earth with like, you know, seven eighths of the population being exterminated. And, you know, Alice <laughs> right, Bailey right. was like, you know, the, the, the atom bomb was God's gift because now we can just get rid of all the useless eaters and so on. Um, it's just, it's just astonishing how explicit it was. And one thing that I discussed with you, and I, I sent you that um, presentation I done, I, sh- I showed you the slides, mm-hmm. is how much of this ends up in Lovecraft. So Lovecraft, I, I wrote this uh, 11 years ago now. I, I wrote this um, post on The Secret Sun and just showing how the, the Cthulhu mythos with the old ones and the deep ones, the, mm-hmm. the, all these, this ones and that ones, it's all taken from Bailey, but it's all the Watchers. Right. Because it's like so the watchers are, you know, in some tellings are in Tartarus and some tellings are in the abyss. Right. And what do we see in the Cthulhu mythos? It's like, you know, the great old ones are all biding their time, dead, dead, but dreaming. Right. Right. In the depths. Right. And, and it's just it's the watchers. And the thing that really struck me. So, Peter, you know, you mentioned Peter Lavenda and he was talking about how like, oh, you know, um, this all must be true because Crowley was sort of picking up on the same thing as Lovecraft. It's like, yeah, because they're all taking their orders from the same British intelligence handlers, in, hmm. in my estimation. I mean, you know, how does this show up? You know, so we have Bailey, who, you know, a frog could tell that that she was British intelligence up and down the line. And of course, I mean, there's no mystery with Crowley. You know, how are they telling these same stories just in, in different versions? And then it's showing up with, with Lovecraft who was, you know, friends, quote unquote, friends with E. Hoffman Price, who was like blatantly army intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was in the, the expeditionary force and worked for Union Carbide with this like, you know, just basically um, no show job. And uh, it, it's all it's all watcher mythology, but it's, it, you know, it sort of takes these different forms, right? Right. right. But it's all the same thing. And then what we see more recently is all these sort of like super race things, you know, sort of working from the the X-Men model, things like, uh, you know, the gifted and sense eight and even things like Harry Potter. So it's like all these sort of like, you know, a race apart, um, the, the new breed, the new humanity. And it's and it's all sort of emanations of the same mythos. Um, just updated for modern audiences. But if you trace it all back to Alice, Alice Bailey, and then you read her early books like um, Initiation, Human and Solar, and Coming a Cosmic Fire and so on, she she is, she is does not beat her on the bush. She's like, the watchers were the good guys, and they're waiting you know, for the things, the conditions to be right, where they'll take over again, you know, so... And then the, the, the loosest trust winds up with offices uh, right next to the United Nations and uh, in and Wall Street <laughs> and in White Whitehall. Wall Street, that that yeah. So so the loosest trust. Um, their 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 original headquarters is is right next to um, GCHQ in London. Right. Right. And then their their uh, offices in New York are at 120 Wall Street. Which, if you look at that building, it's clearly modeled on on Entemanaki, which was the model for the Tower of Babel. Right? It's, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, in, 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 <laughs> in any case, it's like, it's it's basically, you know, in a Sumerian ziggurat style. Right, so, right. And it's just like, gee, how did that happen? And then how do people like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and all these big corporations and banks and stuff, you know, why are they sending this silly little, you know, on the face of it, the silly little cult made up almost entirely of little old ladies, like why are they just pumping them full of money? And Mm -hmm. my argument is, is that they're setting up an infrastructure, you know, for this cult, for the watcher cult. Mm. And like I said, I mean, it's just, you know, people think, oh, this guy's just making leaps all over the place. Just go back and read her books. She does not hide her agenda in any way, shape or form. So. It's really astonishing uh, that uh, the church is is so blind to this because mm-hmm. it's it's so in the in their face. I think the response from most American Christians, anyway, is that uh, well, this stuff's all made up, so there's no harm to it because these gods, these these entities, don't even exist. Uh, survey after survey by uh, groups like George Barna 
who's now at Arizona Christian University. 60% of American Christians don't believe that Satan's a literal entity, it's just a concept to represent evil. So these, these, you know, what's the harm, you know? Well, I'll tell you how this all ties together for me. Are you familiar with uh, Carl Raschke? Um, I should be. The name is ringing a bell, but... Uh, okay, Carl Raschke is a theologian and professor. And he he's written a number of books on like Christian theology and stuff. But he wrote a book, um, or he wrote a paper on, on ultra-terrestrials. And he was talking about like, you know, how the, when you get past all the, the nonsense and the science fiction and the sensationalism, how the UFO phenomenon is, is, is actually working. And what he, ta- in what he said that like, again, this was another light going uh, off moment for me. Um, you know, he said that, um, you know, he's speculating what the goals of these, what he called ultra terrestrial beings would be. And he said, the goal would be like, they want, to bring us into their realm hmm. or, or, and, or enter into our realm. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, DMT, the DMT trials, you know, the right, machine elves, right. I mean, all these entities, um, you hear this over and over again from these people who undergo these, um, experiments, you know, where they, they meet these, these beings that he's, that he calls ultra terrestrials. And, you know, I would, you know, based on several thousand years of history, would call demons. I'm sure you would as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe not so much in like the, the Hollywood uh, Grand Guignol uh, tradition, but, the, you know, the tradition that like Augustine talks about in City of God. But to me, I, I you know, I, I think they're all deceivers deceiving spirits you know mm-hmm. uh, they they just have their own agenda and and the, i don't think they think too much of us at all and i it really frightens me like i said that we see this mk ultra 3.0 where they want to test people with depression with ketamine and uh dmt and all these like very very heavy high doses of serious hallucinogens that again i mean what you know when I talked about what what Owsley Stanley said at the at the acid test, he said this is witchcraft, mm-hmm. and that's how I just come to see it all. I mean, I I really believe that you know that science is the plumbing. You know, science and technology is just basically the plumbing, and that hmm. the world in fact runs on sorcery. That sorcery rules the world that we live in, not science. Science is just basically. A means to an end. That makes sense. Why isn't it more in our face? For example, there was an event uh, just over a year ago, uh, that Travis Scott Astro World concert where uh, 10 people Mm. died. Mm. And it was pretty Mm -hmm. clear when you saw the imagery there that, uh, boy, that stage looks like the entryway into hell. And when you start digging into what uh, the, the other imagery that he was publicizing for this tour, it's pretty clear that's what he was trying to evoke. But that's oh, the pretty- watchers, though. I mean, I've done, a, I've, I've done. He, he depict, he did a video where he depicted himself as, as you know, like Nephilim, Anakim, Raphaim, as, right. as a giant, mm-hmm. you know, who is backed by this this giant orb with this giant eyeball. So it's, it's all, you know, I, I did a, a lot of that because so everybody's saying this is satanic, and it's like, well, yeah, I mean, small s satanic, but what it really is is that it's watcher worship, and you know. The stage with the mountains, it's Mount Tremont. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know I mean? you know what I mean? And it's like this <clears throat> sort of vortex entrance. And then you see the t-shirts with like the, the figures coming, you know, walking through the door and everything. Um, that's that's pretty in your face <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. You know, because I went back and then I looked at some of the other imagery from previous World concerts. And it's it's just, to me, it just seems to be like straight up watcher worship. And, you know, watchers and, and, and Nephilim, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, critics or those who are trying to, you know, provide cover so that the uh, most people just still stay asleep and say, well, he's just an entertainer. He's trying to, you know, get a reaction. It's just, uh, you know, it's art. It, it doesn't really mean anything. But when we start seeing things like coming back around to this uh, now statue on the New York uh, appellate courthouse in uh, Manhattan. And you didn't mention that it was part of like a, the 
that the now statue and then the other statue, which is called witness. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Witness. Right. (laughs) Watcher. Yeah. (laughs) But the the two, the two statues together are called Hava, which is, I guess it's Pakistani or something for Eve. Uh, It's very close to the Hebrew. Yes. And and to me, when I hear that, all I think of is, um, is Lilith, you know, who Mm -hmm. in certain like uh, Talmudic texts and so on was called the first Eve. You know, so Lilith was like the first Eve. And I, I again, I mean, that's, but like the witness, I mean, <laughs> and it's yeah. gigantic too. You know, it's like this big giant in the middle of the park called witness. I mean, how much more blatant does it have to be? You know, one of the things that really blew our minds when we were researching our book, which really dealt with the cult of uh, the cult of the Rephaim in the ancient world, and how it influenced the Bible is a, uh, finding out that um, the Hebrew word for cities, irim, is identical to the Aramaic word, which is a very similar language, uh, the Aramaic word for watchers. So Mm. the watchers in Daniel chapter 4, the faithful watchers who come down and and decree the punishment to Nebuchadnezzar for his uh, pride, uh, by decree of the watchers, and by the way, the word uh, of that uh, goddess, uh, Kadesh, is very similar to the uh, Hebrew word for um, holy one. Kodesh. Well, it, 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 sacred, sacred. Essentially what it means, I mean, right. Yeah. yeah. But Th- uh, those are the temple prostitutes right. that you read about all throughout the Bible, Old Testament. But there is a uh, there are a couple of verses in the Old Testament where it appears that the word cities is used when watchers is probably a better fit, like in Isaiah 14, which is that uh, famous chapter that in the King James reads, uh, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Uh, verse 19 reads... Um, but you are cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch. And, and that's actually a loan word from Egyptian. Um, Netzer, which means dead god. It's uh, used to describe Osiris, usually. Uh, mm-hmm. So like a loathed dead god. Clothed with the slain, those pierced by the sword who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. Uh, and then verse 21. May the offspring of evildoers never more be named. Prepare slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers. <clears throat> Lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the world with Irim, with cities, or with watchers. <laughs> Uh, and there's another verse in Numbers chapter 24, which is the prophecy of Balaam, the prophet who was supposed to curse Israel, and he blessed them instead, uh, where, uh, you know, the star shall rise from Jacob, and uh, it, he basically will destroy the survivors of cities, you know, or of the watchers. Well, maybe I, maybe there's just a, a very close connection between the two, because when you talk about the cult of the giants, the first thing that comes to my mind and you probably know this, is that all the Sumerian kings were called Lugal, mm-hmm. right? Right, big man. They were like, you know, Lugal's, you know, whoever. And Lugal means giant. Uh-huh, big man, yeah. So um, I don't know if that was, you know, just some term that was hereditary, but to yeah. me, I think that what, it, what that indicates, particularly since the Lugals, like you, you so you're talking about the cities were all connected to, they were all lords of city-states, you know, mm-hmm. Ur and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, to me, what that says is that there was a, a very close connection between giants and cities. So to me, right. that sort of backs up your interpretation of, of Isaiah. And what's what's even more interesting is that the uh, these giants, the Nephilim, were created by the Mesopotamia, the, the Hebrew watchers, a uh, scholar by the name of Omar Anus showed this in a paper about 15 years ago now, uh, that the, they were the Mesopotamian Apkalu. Apkalu, that's yeah, right. And yeah, and uh, in, in Akkadian, that would be, it's a, a, Apkalu is the Akkadian. In, in Sumerian, it would be Abgalu, which means big man from water, because they come from the Abzu, the abyss. Yeah, well, see, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. So uh, I don't know if you watched any of the World Cup, no. So the World Cup was in Qatar, right? Mm-hmm. And Qatar, of course, is just right across the the little bay there from Dubai. Mm-hmm. And the thing, so, you know, this whole, I don't know, call it awakening, but just like starting to notice how in your face the symbolism can get. Back in 2008, not long after Obama's election, they opened the Atlantis uh, Hotel and casino 
in Dubai, and they had this um, they had this whole. I mean, it must have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. This whole celebration for it, and and it was lorded over by this priestess who who looked like she was dressed, you know, like a priestess of Dagon. You know, mm-hmm. it was like mm-hmm. you know, it was almost like a, a a mermaid or something. And you know, she's and then they have like like the sons of Horus come in. I, it was just like, wait a minute. I thought this was like a a Muslim theocracy. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. But, but the the point is, is that we I I saw a lot of the same imagery, and I and I blogged about this as well with the World Cup because they had this um this quote unquote mascot, right? Mm-hmm. And it was um it took this I guess this Moroccan pop star in this video. You know, the mascot comes from this this other world, you know, this parallel dimension. They go through this vortex into this other world. And it's like the mascot is saying, uh, you know, you didn't understand. You know, we, we've been trying to reach you. We've been trying to communicate with you for, for thousands of years. And you thought we were like Bigfoot or UFOs or ghosts or whatever. But and, and I'm just sitting there going, this, this is it, man. This is like the same symbolism. Like, like I said, you just see all these different uh culturally specific versions of it but mm-hmm. it all boils down in my estimation to the watchers which you know in the context of what rashki was talking about is like these ultra terrestrial beings that want to be here you know what i mean like yeah they they, they want somehow to interact with us and and, and my feeling would be is that they want to possess us. They want to use us as their vessels. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, you were talking about the, yeah. X, the X-Files before. I mean, like the black oil and so mm-hmm. on. Right, right. What is it? The black oil comes up from the ground and it possesses people, you know, and it, and it recreates them in its image. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there, there's a hint that uh, this is sort of the end game in the prophecy of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. God uh, concludes that by saying, okay, this is what's going to happen at the end. Uh, Let me bring up the verse here, so I'm not trying to remember it. Uh, I'm at an age where that doesn't work as well as it used to. Uh, On that day, I will give to Gog, which is the Old Old Testament uh, Jewish concept of the Antichrist, uh, the great end times enemy of Yahweh. I will give to Gog a place for burial in Israel, the Valley of the Travelers east of the sea. In Hebrew, that's Avarim. It will block the travelers, for their Gog and all his multitude will be buried. The word travelers is a term that was used by the Canaanites for the Rephaim. Mm. So, uh, and interestingly, when Moses was told to climb Mount Nebo, we can kind of identify where this is, because in Deuteronomy, where God says to Moses, okay, climb this mountain and get your only look at the promised land, it's called this mountain of Avarim, this mountain of the travelers. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, literally, Rephaim texts, the Rephaim texts from the ancient kingdom of Ugarit from about the time of the judges, 200 years after Moses, call them, call the Rephaim travelers because they travel apparently or cross over. And uh, they're summoned to the uh, the threshing floor of El, which was their version of Saturn, Kronos, Baal, Haman, Enlil, Dagon, Molech, mm-hmm, which would mm-hmm. be the summit of Mount Hermon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in this text, it literally says they mount their chariots, they travel first one day and then another, and then they arrive at dawn of the third day, which for Christians should send the hair on your back at your neck standing up where the blessing of the name of El will revivify or resurrect the heroes. Mm. Um, when you consider that these were the, the, the inspiration, the Rephaim, and again, going back to that scholar Amar Anus, for the Greek heroes, the demigods like Heracles and Perseus, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he showed that the, the term used by Homer and Hesiod for the men of the golden age, when Kronos ruled in heaven, Merope's anthropoi, translated usually into English as mortal men, but that word Merope's derives from the same Semitic root as Rephaim. So this, this hero worship of the ancestors is very old, and it derives from their progenitors, the Watchers and Mount Hermon, 
Mm -hmm. And if we credit Ezekiel, maybe I'm reading too much into Ezekiel and the War of Gog and Magog, but if these travelers are part of this war, these vessels for these spirits could make up the army of the Antichrist at the final battle of Armageddon. Well, see, that's getting into what I was saying with MK Ultra, and then kind of connecting that to what Russ Jizdar talked about with the Black Awakening. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's interesting, too, because, you know, when you talk about um, these various races of giants, so the Anakim were based in Hebron, right? They were in the high country, uh, the the highlands of Judah and Israel, uh, according to Joshua, I think 21, I'm thinking, or maybe 12, I'd have to go back and look. Anyway, where they summarize the conquest of Canaan, it emphasized the fact that Joshua and the Israelites wiped out the Anakim from the whole land, except for Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod, the Philistine cities, which of course is where Goliath and his buddies came from later. Well, who, which one of these uh, peoples were based in Hebron? Uh, the Amorites. It's where Abraham was uh, friends with uh, a couple of Amorites who helped him chase after Lot and their abductors. All right. I would have to look this up because um, I had done this thing about, you know, connecting the uh, the Betty and Barney Hill thing to uh, when Aleister Crowley spent a summer in New Hampshire at the um, as the guest of Josephine Adams, who was a uh, a descendant of John Adams. She was a, a famous um, no, it's Evangeline Adams. She was a famous uh, astrologer at the time. And he had these uh, experiences with like ball lightning and stuff. But this was about 40 miles down the highway from Indian Head with, you know, Betty and Barney Hill had claimed to be um, abducted. Mm-hmm. And then they, you know, when they came back, when they woke up, they were driving through Hebron. Hmm. where uh, Crowley had summered. Um, And then, of course, a few years ago, (laughs) this just makes me laugh, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell was a little further down the highway when they they arrested her on World UFO Day. And, of course, her uh, sister was married to the son of Jack Parsons' partner, at JPL, you know, one big happy family, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I mean, it's so, it sounds so tortured and scattered, and a lot of people just think, like, what, what's going on here? What are these guys talking about? But basically, I mean, what it really all boils down to, and, and like I said, I, I go through great lengths to walk people through all this, mm-hmm. because it does get very overwhelming. And, and, but, you, and you were right, by the way, I, I was forgetting Numbers 1322, where uh, the the uh, descendants of Anak were the uh, residents of Hebron at the time of the uh, conquest. So yeah, Ahaman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. Well, see, but that also connects to, you know, the Space Brothers, you know, the Tall Whites, what they call them, or the, um, the Nordics. And that sort of comes from uh, sort of the post-Adamski thing. But the Basically, what it boils down to, just <laughs> kind of rein this in for you know, yep, people yep. might be lost, but there is this strange um, but increasingly open nexus between uh, esoteric ufology, these wa- what I call these watcher cults, which have very strong basis in the Space Brothers, which ties back to that esoteric ufology again um mk ultra and what i call mk ultra 3.0 which is just basically putting as many school children on as many you know mind-altering drugs as they can manage which has been going on for a number of years now mm-hmm. but it's just accelerating you know particularly with the introduction of the the puberty blockers and the hormones and so on which are making uh children insane and suicidal mm-hmm. um but there, there is, and then the symbolism, like the public symbolism, you know, these public rituals that I've been looking at for a number of years now, where if you really break down the symbolism, it's just really in your face, you know. And like you you had mentioned before, it's all sort of cloaked in under the guise of, you know, the rubric of art. You know, this is an art installation, you know, exactly like this statue that we see. 
in Madison Square. But it's just like I think a lot of people are just starting to cotton to it because that statue does not belong on that building in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. And it has nothing to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know, even if they did give her a little lace collar, I, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a demonic representation of these, you know, these goddesses. Um, and, you know, the, you know, Lilitu, the demons and so on, you know, these goddesses of war and lust and so on. Um, that seem to be, you know, the spirit that they want to invoke yes. in this age. Absolutely. You know, it's, 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 it's invocation. So basically, you know, just to boil it down to one word, it's just basically um, sorcery. It, it seems like very scattered and haphazard. And, and it, it almost seems like, you know, that meme from uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia with a guy like, oh, you know, it's got all the connections on the walls and stuff. But um if you're not familiar with it, it does sound like that. But once you start to really investigate this material and break it down to its core components, you realize that it's just just different guises. But the, the core components are always the same. They're always the same. And they just repeated ad nauseum. And, um, you know, and now we're in the middle of World War III. Mm-hmm. Um you know, we're in the early days of World War Three. I yep. mean, the early days of these kind of wars, people don't ever believe that there's actually a war going on. Right. You know? I mean, we've seen that throughout history. And uh, no, I, I agree with you. I've been saying this for for months that uh, we are stumbling into World War Three. Sharon has been researching this because her Red Wing saga is leading up to World War One, and so she's been doing a lot of reading. And she said that this looks a lot like 1913 and 1914. I said, yeah, yeah. It's oh, just going to yeah. yeah, take a trigger, does. but uh, hopefully, hopefully, cooler heads will prevail before we get there. But um, whenever things I start, don't count on it. No, well, whenever things start getting a little uh, overwhelming, I just turn back to Psalm two: "He who sits in the heavens laughs; he holds them in derision." So uh, the World Economic Forum and the globalists who are pulling these strings right now think that they're winning, but a day is coming where. Uh, the one who created the universe spoke by speaking into, into existence is going to say, okay, I warned you, don't make me come down there, but now I'm coming down there. Um, well, but see, but here's the thing. So this is another aspect of what I'm talking about. So the, the World Economic Forum are putting all their meetings online now. Mm-hmm. So it used to be like, oh, it was all secret. And you're like, oh, are these must be like a bunch of uh, Bond villains all meeting in secret and coming up with these. And then you realize it's just a bunch of dorks. Well, that's it's a it. bunch of weirdos, you know, and it's like all their plans, all their plans with like, you know, um, eating crickets and so, on, you know, and, and just like all their ideas, you know, um, are against God's law. They're against nature. They, that, that's who they're, they're at war with nature is really what it is. They're, they're at war with natural law because of ego. And because right, they all right. had rich parents and they're all raised in bubbles completely separate from the, the experiences of, you know, 99.9% of humanity, um, they just have no concept. I mean, these people couldn't even tell you how much a gallon of milk costs, you right. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, they're just weirdos. And I and that's another, you know, this is another thing that, you know, people look at that statue and they're just like, what the hell? <laughs> You know, yeah. why don't you just put it, you know, if you want to honor, like, you know, women in, in law, so why don't you just put a statue of Ruth Gitt Ginsburg up, you know? I mean, she's right. passed away, you know? It's like, why do you just, you know, why do you have to put this weird demon with, like, these weird, I don't yeah. know, noodles Serpen- for arms? Serpentine uh, yeah. appendages, right. And, and like, the big, you know, the big ram's horns and so on, you right. know, like, it looks like Baphomet or something. Mm-hmm. Why do you why do you have to do it that way? You know, really? why, why does it have to be? And and I think you know, people are starting to get it. You know, and this is why they they're really hammering this whole thing with disinformation and misinformation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really just a way of of silencing dissent, um, or, and and more importantly, silencing criticism. Right. I mean, these people think that they're above criticism. Yeah, they're it is not mutual. tolerated. It's not tolerated yeah. exactly. So. Um, yeah, you know, these are very interesting times. Yeah. I, uh, I I think the technocrats, let's just call them, are going to lose big time. You know, I mean, even if 
if the, if you didn't add in all the the, the the demonic stuff and the weird cultism and so on, just at the core of these crazy ideas they have, then they're, they're not they're not workable. You know, like smart cities and so on. It's like where are we going to get all the, the the rare earth metals and so on, and the neon and the right, freon and right. all the rest of it to build the machines that they need for this technological nightmare world. Mm-hmm. We're not. And, you know, the, you know, the issues with the supply chains. So it's like, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. They're going to lose. Um, you know, the question is going to be, like, how much suffering are we all going to experience between the today and the inevitable day of the destruction? Yeah. Well, it begins with knowledge. As the prophet Hosea once wrote, my people are destroyed for lack of, and uh, Chris has been out there on the front lines trying to decipher these um, mystic and mystical messages that are being implanted in plain sight on on our television screens and our art installations in our cities and and so on. He blogs about it at secretsun.blogspot.com and uh, the Secret Sun Institute of Advanced Synchro Mysticism. Chris, people want to follow your work more directly and support you. How do they do that? Well, uh, that's my Patreon and you can uh, find the link at, at the Secret Sun blog. Um, this week, I'm going to be doing my presentation. I don't know if you ever saw the series, uh, Lucifer's Technologies, hmm. basically talking about how the, you know, basically the technological infrastructure for the computer chip revolution and so on really arose in this period of very heavy duty occult mass ritual, uh, things like uh, Project Diana and Operation Crossroads and the Trinity Test. I mean, there was this whole series of what, you know, people call mega rituals that all sorts of starts to culminate in the quote unquote invention of the transistor shortly <laughs> this is what it all connects shortly after alistair crowley's death um bell laboratories comes out with uh, mm-hmm. and of course bell laboratories their symbol and and their successor company um at&t um <clears throat> you know you know the symbol the symbol of famous you know what i mean uh, they call it uh like uh what is it genius genius of electricity aka the spirit of communication mm-hmm. but it's it's Phanus who is lucifer so it's like literally lucifer's technologies <laughs> and you know when the thing i pointed out today when i was sort of i did this post catalog on all these like hideous demons that they're putting up and all these key installations um st louis university uh the, which is a jesuit run yes university of all places they have what i call trans Phanus at the gate you know, and, and it's like a, another one of these kind of statues that anyone would just look at and, and recognize as being demonic. <laughs> you know, I'm going to I'm gonna have to go visit that when I go up to visit our daughter next time. I'm, I'm working on a follow-up novel of The God Conspiracy, and because I spent some time in St. Louis, that's one of the major settings there. There's a, a big building there that was uh, housed AT&T and then Southwestern Bell, and then it's, it's just sitting empty right now, this 43-story building or whatever. Yeah, that's just empty. But there's an <laughs> there's an art park right across the street from it with some really creepy statuary, and uh, so that'll. Oh, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, yeah, and you know what is that arch for anyway? Yeah, we'll we'll have to investigate some of that. I'll, I'll put links in the in the show notes to uh, Chris's blog, Chris's uh, Patreon page, and uh, I think Sharon and I are gonna have to start uh, uh, paying closer attention to uh, your work because it's it's going to inform what we're doing. We've been coming at it from the ancient text, you know, trying to read the cosmology of the ancient Mesopotamians and wh- how that all fits together, you know, the the religion of Greece and Rome and the, the Canaanites and the, the Hurrians and um but uh, we're, we're we're not spending as much time deciphering the the symbolism that's right in front of us and we need to do that more. Uh, so, Chris, thanks for taking it's some the time same out. Symbolism, dude. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's it just bringing back the old guys. All that ancient stuff. It's it's a piece of cake. It's because it's all right there, right in front of your face. They're they're bringing they're getting the old band back together. <laughs> <laughs> the band, Elwood. Yeah, Chris, thanks for your time tonight. Uh, always a pleasure talking to you, Derek.
Thank you. And thank you for, for all your watchers and listeners to, for putting up with my um, lunatic ravings. I hope I didn't uh, sound, come across as being too unhinged. <laughs> Check our show notes at vftb.net or wherever else you are consuming this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, God bless you. Subscribe, click that little bell for the notifications, but then download our free app because our app will help you bypass the gatekeepers of big tech. At some point, we're going to say something that will get us banned, canceled, or shadow banned at least. They may even go back and they've already done that. Within the last 12 months, they've gone back more than a year and a half and found something they didn't like, which uh, got us a strike on our channel. So uh, rather than worry about uh, everything we say all the time, we just recommend you get the app because that gets you all of our content. This video program every week, our weekly 30-minute broadcast, Unraveling Revelation, plus our two podcasts, our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship, and the podcast that started this whole journey, PID Radio. And as uh, time allows, we're going back and adding in archives going all the way back to 2005. So check out the classic VFTB and uh, PID Radio classic sections of the Gilbert House app, the GHTV app. You'll find a link to the app store at vftb.net or go to our main website, which is gilberthouse.org. And uh, gilberthouse.org slash app is where you'll find you'll find that link. A couple of things to tell you about, including an exciting uh, update on our trip to Turkey. Now, I'm going to have to get used to saying Turkey Yay because that is the official official name now according to the United Nations. The Turks want us to pronounce it their way and it's their country, so well enough. Um, but first, we have got a new project Sharon and I are working on in 2023 and um, we are asking for your help in this project. It is uh, We're calling it Build Barn Better. Build Barn Better. The World Economic Forum's got its Build Back Better plan, which has been adopted by everybody from uh, <laughs> to Joe Biden, uh, Boris Johnson, Justin Trudeau, Pope Francis, uh, and of course, the World Economic Forum. Uh, but uh, we think the pr- plan is more accurately Build Back Babble. That's for another day. Uh, we, we are calling our plan Build Barn Better. We've got a 1,200 square foot building on our property, a pole barn. It's a metal shop building on a concrete slab. And for the last eight years, it's essentially just held overflow from the house and our yard tractor and uh, all the things that we moved up from my mother's house in South Carolina when she retired. We had to move her up here near us and she had to downsize. So that's all out in the barn right now. Thankfully, uh, and here's the, here's the thing. Thankfully, we need more space. Because, as you can tell, this is a spare bedroom in the house. If you're watching this on on video, our uh, Unraveling Revelation comes from another bedroom in the house. PID Radio is in the room directly behind me, and our shipping office for books and DVDs is across the hall that way. Which means that when we have visitors, they sleep on the couch out there. We would like to reclaim our house. So we've got a 1,200 square foot building. It's got power in it already. We just need to insulate it and uh, run the power all the way around, add HVAC. We think we can do that for under $15,000 altogether, which is cheap compared to what we'd have to spend if we were buying a building or building from scratch. So we are blessed in that we've already got the facility. We just need to bring it up to speed so that we can um, use it year-round. And to be quite honest, it would also get me out of the house for a while so that would give Sharon some hours during the day when... We're not here talking to each other so that she can focus and write. Love working from home. Love being around my wife all the time. And that is truly a blessing to be married to and working with your best friend. But um, it's difficult to write when there's somebody that you want to talk to sitting on the other side of the room. So if I can work out there during the day doing our video editing and whatnot, and she's got time in here to write, that would be uh, truly a blessing. So if you are so led... Of course, your prayers are the most important thing to us, but if you are so led, you can find a place at uh, the website, vftb.net or gilberthouse.org. You'll find a link that's uh, in the right-hand column there or uh, gilberthouse.org slash donate, and uh, we appreciate your uh, your help. Our first year in ministry has just been God proving that when you step out in faith and it's his direction that... Um, things will happen. So again, thank you. Uh, coming up, we've got, of course, the Israel tour. That uh, 
ship has probably sailed, but if you're interested, you can still get in touch with Lipkin Tours to find out because we uh, uh, kick off the tour on March 19th. So it's just about six weeks out now. Um, but um, other than that, our, our next tour, uh, and we've got dates now confirmed of uh, a tour of Turkey, or um, excuse me, Turkey A, eh? October 18th through November 3rd. We had talked about a tour last year, you might remember. Um, put it off because of concerns about security with uh, the Russia-Ukraine war going on. But we have talked we talked to the uh, tour company, uh, whom we trust, and they say that uh, 2022, despite what was happening on the other side of the Black Sea, was a record year for tourism in Turkey. And in fact, many Ukrainians and Russians moving to get away from the fighting are relocating to Turkey because it's safe. So, October 18th through November 3rd, we've got uh, some information on the website right now. We're still finalizing um, who all is coming with us, but for sure, we've got our good friends, Dr. Judd Burton and Dr. Aaron Judkins joining us. And because they have been working on research for a book about the influence of the Watchers on Gobekli Tepe, having them with us when we visit Gobekli Tepe, seemed like a really good idea. So, um, October 18th through November 3rd of 2023. And uh, right now you can find out uh, just the basics at gilberthouse.org slash travel. And uh, more information will be coming from the tour company as soon as everything is uh, together. But uh, this it's uh, this is a, a bucket list type thing. Because the, the places on this tour, uh, Chadal Hoyak, Gobekli Tepe, of course, Abraham's hometown of Haran, San Liurfa, which may be Ur of the Chaldees, from which Abraham moved to Haran, and a site called Arslan Tepe, which is the northernmost outpost of the kingdom of Nimrod, the ancient city-state of Uruk. So we're, we're going places besides the sites of the seven churches of Revelation and uh, the Plutonia, the gates of hell. So uh, if you're interested in joining us, gilberthouse.org slash travel. Uh, Find us on social media, all the usual places. I'll put that all over. I forget which side of the screen this comes in on. Anyway, it's on one of these sides of the screen. You'll see all the places you can follow us on social media. Our, our announcer is DC Good, and A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.